Yeah, hi everybody. I think it's it's good to see um, that how well that that many people got together for this for this event. I think it's a, I think it's a first for Civi to do this online thing, and um, I think I was a bit critical, but it seems to be working just fine. Uh, I think my camera is out of focus. Um, yeah. Also, um, I think it's great to see that our communities can come together on like a cause like this as well. Um, I think it's a strength as a community that we have that most of us, if not all of us, do have so, some sense of the common good, obviously, otherwise we would be working in this area. Um, so I can, I can um, sort of show you a little bit about an extension that we created um, like two months ago, already way into lockdown, so we were a bit late. Uh, but the idea is um, to facilitate matching people that offer help and uh, people that need help. Um, I actually have um, prepared a couple of slides. Let me know whether that works for you. Can you see those or is that any feedback? No? You can see it. All right, yeah. perfect. Yeah, it's all good. Um, okay, so um, so why do you want to do this? So actually, this wasn't our idea. Uh, there was um, a client who came up with it and said, we're overwhelmed. So they're a local organization um, and they were trying to connect people within their town, actually Hamburg, so it's, it's quite a big town. And they were kind of overwhelmed trying to figure out how to sort of arrange and sort of match all these people offering help and um, uh, and uh, requesting help. So um, just a couple of, um, on the slides, a couple of like general points. Obviously a crisis like this can um, affect people in a lot of different ways. Obviously the main one is medical, but that's not something we could help with. But a lot of the things uh, that can happen to people have have quite severe consequences as well, even if it's not medical. Um, point being, a lot of them might be locked up, maybe they're quarantined, maybe maybe they're positive and don't want to go out because, I mean, tested positive and they want to go out because uh, obviously they don't want to infect people. And that could get people into a lot of trouble, um, especially if they don't have a personal network close by, which in nowadays happens more often than not. I guess, especially in, in bigger cities. Um, so the idea was, um, and I've, I've seen that in my neighborhood with like people like, uh, putting up um, flyers on lampposts and stuff. But for this to be a little more organized, it's a, it was a good idea from that organization that I was talking about that I actually invited to come in here today and present themselves, but they couldn't. Um, but so to do this on a, a bit more organized, larger scale, um, it, it was a good idea for them because they already had um, a big database of local helpers. Um, and then it's a lot easier to contact people and sort of have like a concerted effort to organize this help. So um, here's just a couple of ideas of uh, just to give you an idea what kind of needs there are. I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with the idea. Um, so you can't go shopping anymore. It's a problem. You, you have a dog, you need the dog needs to be walked. Um, not even to mention the, the psychological implications of being locked uh, locked up alone. I mean, obviously, um, most people hopelessly, hopefully weren't, but being locked up for, for weeks on end and you're alone is, is quite challenging on you. So how do we help those people? Ideally, it's based on the community because uh, people from the same community, from the same neighborhood, Basically, they're most most motivated um, to help their neighbors out. They know they know the area, they know the neighborhood, um, and also if, for example, uh, somebody would want to help you go shopping, if you know they live around the corner, it's a different it's a different story than if they were sent from I don't know three towns over. So the idea is uh, to ideally match those people. Um, on, we'll get into this later, but like ideally they would be from the neighborhood. That's why um, the, solving this problem of 
those people in need, uh, needing help, um, by uh, sort of finding like uh, people who can help out in the close community, I think is the best approach to this problem. Um, and as I said, uh, or as I put on the slides as well, I think some of them might even be bored. I mean, we had a lot of, when the schools went into lockdown here, a lot of the, the pupils put up these kind of flyers because they said basically we can't do anything, so they just as well help you out. And I do believe that these kind of uh, mutual help relationship might might persist um, through even through beyond beyond the crisis. I think it it could really strengthen the community as well. Um, so why would you want to use Civi for that? Um, I mean, obviously most of those people in here. Um, have something to do with Siri one way or another. But um, it's for me, it was a good match because if you already use Siri, then um, it's pretty much just installing the extension. Um, it's If you already have um, a local supporter base, then uh, it's pretty easy to get the word out. All you could do is like send out an email blast to all the people that you know. And for you, it's it's easier to spot fraud and I'm I'm using the the term fraud here in like a um it, it's not yeah it's a bit mean but I can see that happening that people are trying to abuse the situation and if you don't have a, an eye on that the whole thing could fall apart if you you, you use uh, uh, you lose your credibility with your organization so it is important to keep fraudulent uh, users at least in mind I think that being said, if most of the users are already known to you, that it's fairly easy to address this problem. Um, if you if the local organization doesn't use Civicium, um, well, um, it's a good basis anyway, because all the kind of follow up that needs to be done beyond sort of matching these people um, is tracking what how it, how it went uh, and all these kind of things. CVCRM has a million options for doing that, and it's actually that, that's what it's made for. So it's act, it, even though it's a big system, it, it's a very good match for what needs to be done after the matching as well. Uh, plus, ideally, um, if you start using this way, you can hopefully keep um, this contact base for a long time. Um, obviously, you'd have to get people's consent, but um, I can really see that working um, in your favor in the future. Um, how does it work? It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, the extension provides um, a offer help and a request help form it, with a public URL that you just uh, send out in an email or publish somewhere. And then what happens is um, the contact data gets matched because we don't want to create a lot of duplicates. Ideally, we want to, to match this um, the data input uh, put in uh, to uh, already existing contacts, ideally, and if they don't, then then you create a new one. Um, so that's the one thing. The other thing is that you need to geocode the address because, as I said, ideally we match people who live close to each other, and the only way of doing that is to um, basically have um, a service lookup for geo coordinates of an address. And that's basically it. So that's how they how people get into the system with the with their needs and their requests. Um, and then it's a pretty straightforward thing. There's an algorithm that helps you pair these people up. So um, the algorithm considers um, help types. So you could use the extension to just define various types of help, uh, like shopping, like walking the dog or whatever. Or you could just basically use it as general help. Uh, but if you have uh, defined different help types, then people who offer or request help can decide which kind of help they need or, or, or could provide. Um, and this way you try to match, um, obviously, according to that. Also the physical distance. Um, and also what comes into play here is that um, uh, you can have, as a um, helper, you can have, you could be helping multiple people and the algorithm considers that as well. So they don't just, uh, somebody has, to provide help to them, people just they live in the center and the ones in the outskirts wouldn't. So there's a kind of a balance there. Um, the next step would then be um, after the algorithm sort of suggests pairs of helpers and helpies, 
um, is to somehow confirm that match. Um, and I mean, you could do it automatically as I wrote, but um, that's kind of risky because anyone uh, who would sign up would could be matched to to a person that is actually already in need of help, and um, we want to kind of avoid there being being any kind of abusive cases. You could also do it manually, but that's kind of a lot of work. And I think the way to go is something in between, but that really depends a lot on the, your data structure and your organization. Um, so that's that's probably nothing we could sort of um, provide by default. But it's something to to think about. Um, and then as a third step, basically you just communicate. But once you've confirmed um, the relationship between those, then um, you can just um, use CVCM's facilities to just send out an email or whatever you want in order to connect those people and send them the mutual addresses or something like that. Um, and then uh, what comes after this is kind of beyond the scope of the implementation of the, of, the, of the extension, but it's something that you have to think about, obviously, because just with the matching, it doesn't end. You have to think about what happens. You, you want to know how it went. You want to process complaints. You want to know when it ended, because uh, if people don't tell you that you're free to help somebody else again at some point, then um, you, you're not going to be assigned any, any more uh, requests. So yeah, I think that's basically it. Um, if that sounds interesting to you, join me in room five, and um, yeah, we can we can talk about the details. So I'll give you a quick demo of how it looks like. Um, as I said, um, I think the organization was quite happy with it. Um, I have no idea since we published the extension. Um, I haven't gotten a lot of feedback from other people, so I don't really know how many people are, are actively using it. But it'd be good to yeah good to get some feedback from you, from you guys anyway. Yeah, that's me. Great, thank you so much. That's brilliant. I have no idea if my video is coming on screen at the moment, but um, I will just use this moment to introduce the next speaker, um, uh, Louisa Peters uh, from, uh, from Leeds in the UK. Thank you so much for that, Bjorn. Um, Sorry, one moment. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, I haven't got any slides, so you're just gonna have to look at my face, I'm afraid, but um, <laughs> um, I will for the workshop, I do have slides for that, so. <laughs> um, so, I work for a, uh, quite a small community charity in Leeds in the north of England and um, when we went into lockdown um, our local government body our local council basically commandeered like a range of charities across the city um, to become an emergency hub so um, we could deliver um, things like emergency food packages, go shopping, doing the medication deliveries, all that sort of thing. Um, so we were given hundreds of volunteers in one big lump very quickly. And um, our challenge really was how to, to manage that many volunteers. Um, we were already using CIVI as our um, uh, client database and we did already have um, you know a, a group of volunteers on there but nowhere near this number and um, and also managing the logistics a bit like what Bjorn said of matching people up to the referrals we were receiving from the council um, who people who needed help with the volunteer who's then going to go and do it um, so we installed Civi Volunteer onto our um, database as a little extension. Um, as I said, because because we already use it, um, we could then log all our shifts on there. We could advertise it really easily out to all our volunteers. Um, it's the first time we've used it, and I've, it's been a, a godsend really to be able to coordinate. 
um, sort of the logistics of of so many people and and keeping track of them as well and um, monitoring things like the finances for shops um, and just knowing who's going where and picking up what medication that sort of thing so um, it's it was really really good um, so my presentation I'm sort of going to talk through um, how we did that and, and sort of how it looks on Civi uh, and then the realities of it the pros and cons of uh of civvy volunteer because there were some limitations on it um uh which should you know be great to overcome because it it could do some um amazing things to manage really large groups of volunteers um and we're going to be we've been told by the government here that we're going to be doing this for the until at least december so um so yeah it's a really great tool if anyone else out there needs um sort of a way to manage those logistics of um all your volunteers and 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 getting them signed up to do different kinds of help um then yeah this i i thought think it's a really great tool um i'm going to be in room two um and i will have slides at that point as well so you can see what I'm talking about, but that, that's my bit. Uh, I don't need to say any more. <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank, thank you so much, Louisa. Um, just out of interest, how many different blocks of work have been sort of booked through it, just to get a sort of sense of the scale? How many? Yeah, um, we've done, oh, it's been over 200 referrals in the last six weeks. Um, so yeah it's if we didn't have <laughs> something to manage it, it would have been would have been a nightmare because the council sent us a nice spreadsheet you see and i didn't like that so <laughs> grand okay well that sounds a brilliant session uh thank you i'm going to move on to uh the next session um which is um we're going to calgary canada now to um the alex um, and also looking at the management and coordination of workers, but this is paid workers. Um, and I'm going to go over now to uh, Jeff Peters, uh, sorry, Jeff Weber, sorry, you're Louisa Peters. Um, um, let me change the, yeah, Jeff. Hi everyone, greetings from Calgary. I uh, trust everyone can hear me. Um, just a disclaimer, while I am talking about Civi, uh, I, I'm new to this community, so thanks for having me, and I very much uh, am technology challenged. And so I work with people, uh, not computers. Uh, and so um, if anything, this is an advertisement uh, on how someone like me uh, can use, uh, use Civi. So I do have some slides, so I'll share these. And trust, maybe people give me a thumbs up if they see the slides showing up on their screen. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so working closely with Karen, uh, who I think is people are familiar with uh, in Calgary. Um, my role is an associate director of community and social in initiatives with the Alex Community Health Center, uh, which is a fairly large nonprofit in Calgary. Calgary is a city of about 1.2 million people. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you're probably familiar with Banff just down the road, National Park. Uh, and it, it has a, a whole host of, of programming uh, and health and social services uh, for uh, vulnerable um, communities. Uh, and so we have a wide range uh, of, of programming. It's quite a large uh, nonprofit organization. Primarily, it looks at um, primary health care, uh, but it also matches that with social programming. Uh, and so every, we have specialized clinics for youth. Uh, community and seniors. Uh, we also have uh, housing first programs that work with uh, chronically homeless people and then we also have a lot of food and educational programming and wellness programming uh, paired in there and so uh, the crux of that looks like a pretty robust um, organization uh, that largely brings people together in groups uh, and so to eat, uh, to take groups together, mental health supports, uh, basic needs supports, uh, you name it. 
Uh, we were already using Civi. Um, in 2018, um, we made the decision to go paperless. We had moved into a big building. Uh, and that's when we started looking at Civi uh, as, a, as a way to track and store all activities, uh, especially on the social side. So we have medical recording, but everyone who interacts with the Alex typically interacts first uh, with social workers, peer support workers, community advocates, you name it. And so um, every clinic had their own way of doing things. And so in 2018, that shifted and we started to use Civi. Uh, and our COVID response really accelerated how we use Civi, and, and, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, so to give an insight into the Alex uh, programming, um, we have over 60,000 visits a year. Um, we have over 16,000 uh, cl clients or community members that we work with across 15 different clinic types or programs. Uh, we use Civi, and we'll get into how this works, um, to record information, obviously, about how people come, but also um, to, to ask questions and get information about how their lives are improving. Uh, and, may, and I think when we get to our breakout room, Karen can talk about that a bit more. Uh, and that's all going through what we refer to as a, a client dashboard. So every client has a unique ID, and they get their own dashboard assigned to them. Uh, and this is what that looks like. So you can see in the background on the top header there, that's the, that's the Civi component. Uh, and then this is where I, my mouse is, is what um, all Alex staff, and there's about 350 of us, um, this is what we look at. So when, when someone uh, uh, has an interaction, if they come to the Alex for supports, uh, be that uh, our community kitchens uh, or our health centers, um, you name it, uh, everyone's dashboard looks like this and we can record a wide uh, array of, of supports. Um, everything medical, social, referrals, or we can create activities. Um, and uh, you can record activity in any of those categories. And so it's quite, it's quite intuitive and user friendly. Um, you can get demographic information from people, which is really helpful. Um, so age, kind of the social determinants of health is essentially what we're trying to, trying to understand for the people who access our services. Uh, and then we have a, a, a calendar option, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so here's an example. Um, I didn't talk about how the Alex has uh, health buses that go out into communities. Uh, and so here you can see an example of uh, some activity types um, that we collect using our dental health bus. Uh, so we often go to schools or areas where people um, aren't accessing uh, dental supports and so there's there's kind of some deserts in the city uh, and so we'll go to those areas and you can see the different activity types on our dental bus for example uh, and then each of those um, colors uh, that are kind of posted there represent a different activity type so you can actually can you can map and understand and get insights about the kind of services we're doing across the city um, so we were rolling along with Civi and then uh, and using it across all of our clinic types, uh, all of our social supports, uh, and then COVID-19 happened, and I guess that's the meat of uh, what I'll, I'll want to talk about. Uh, so obviously the idea of getting people with fragile and complex health needs together in a room, uh, like the rest of the world, uh, couldn't exist anymore. So we developed all the social staff across the agency, a collaborative way uh, to bring supports to people where they live. Uh, and so we kind of coined that um, social dispatch. And the idea would be you'd call into these phone lines, we'd have our staff uh, working on the phones, uh, and then we would assess uh, how we would support you. That could be mental health, social supports, uh, but also basic needs, so hygiene, medicine, uh, and mostly food supports. Um, we, have, we partner and have a community food center, which has a big commercial kitchen. Uh, and so we were able to create um, food kits and grocery kits for people. Uh, and so now you're talking about working with staff across sites, coordinating, getting, um, coordinating, getting supports and resources to people in the community. Uh, and so we stopped doing our in-house programming. So this is an example that Karen threw in there of how usually we'd have lunch and, 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 uh, social programmings for people, but that stopped obviously in April and we had no on-site supports. Everything became either virtual or we supported people by bringing them, um, you know, basic needs to their homes. And so this is an example of our, our, our community kitchen is that top photo. 
and our community food centers, that bottom fo photo, they kind of got re reimagined into a basic needs and hamper production site and a call center. Uh, and that bottom photo is, a, is an example of the kind of meals that we started to make for people and deliver for people. Uh, this was envisioned at a time when we were looking at pictures of like Italy and stuff and we thought, okay, well, it, we need to make sure that we're supporting people staying home. Uh, and so uh, over uh, COVID, the Alex has helped uh, over 2,000 unique individuals um, with over 7,000 meals. Uh, to put that in perspective, I could eat three meals a day for the next 20 years. So there's been a lot of food that has gone out the door. Um, and so some of the logistics involved in this uh, have been the ability to create a calendar in order to schedule uh, delivery or the, the assembly and delivery of food hampers out to people in, in, in the community. And so to do that, we, we created um, a scheduling feature. And I say we, I mean, Karen created a scheduling feature, um, calendars and daily reports lists, uh, as well as task teams. And so the teams could be the people who work at a certain center. Um, the, uh, the, the scheduling task feature allows someone to be on the phone with someone, take their information, including their address, and then schedule for a delivery of a hamper to that person. And then the person doing the delivery would just have to complete the task and then automatically all that information gets stored. Um, the calendars are great because you can schedule things in advance. Uh, so as the word got out and we, our phone lines got quite busy, we were able to schedule well in advance and able to schedule at times people for a phone check-in or a food delivery at a time that worked for them. Uh, we also got daily reports, which was uh, created, which was really helpful because um, it allowed us to print off and see, uh, let's say if we're making 20 grocery kits or hampers, see the commonalities across them. So flag allergens and that kind of stuff. And that was helpful for not having to go in one by one to create hampers individually. We can kind of create uh, multiples at a time. And so we got our efficiency created uh, as we went. Um, this is the back end a little bit of uh, what our task teams look like. So you can see our different clinic types. Um, so those little CHC, YHCs, that's our community health center, our youth health center. Uh, and you can kind of see how you, uh, a staff member can belong to different teams. And so you can configure your calendars pretty creatively as you need to. Um, sorry, I'm moving fast. I know I have a lot of information to get through. Scheduling a, a task. And so this is what that looks like. Um, so uh, you can uh, have a client and you can assign it to a person's, uh, a person's calendar. Uh, and so th that, that is helpful in the sense that um, this person's dashboard, that original uh, slide that I showed, can then be dropped onto a calendar with information that you wanna, that you wanna grab, right? And, and even down to the activity time, and that's been useful for COVID. If we had to contact trace or understand who interacted with who at a certain time, we would be able to go back and grab that. You can also drop, put uh, details which show up in the calendar, which is an, a great feature and I'll show you that next. Um, so this is just what that back end looks like. So once you schedule something, you can see that it gets um, logged in the back end into Civi. Um, here's how you'd get to a calendar. And so uh, one of the nice things is it's, it's mobile friendly. So um, you're able to, on your mobile device, uh, this is what it looks like on your calendar. And you can click on the activity type to hit a, a scheduled activity and complete it. Um, and this is what this looks like once you click on the activity type. So you can see date, subject, um, you know, this, this link goes to their Alex ID. And if you wanted to update or correct or complete the task, you can just do that very easily on your phone. So you can imagine the drivers out delivering stuff uh, can easily follow um, kind of the line of travel assigned to them. This is what a calendar looks like across the whole team. So you can see all the, all the, all the identifiable information has been taken out, uh, but you can see how people, a, a team's calendar, um, you can assess and, and see what's kind of scheduled and what's being completed. Uh, and you can see up to five uh, calendars at a time. And I, and I know this was important if you're trying to figure out who's where at any given time, you, you can detect that. 
Uh, and you can also obviously configure this many different ways to include the information that you wanted on the back end. Um, so this is that 7 a.m. report. You could you know, get a, a printout of all the information you needed for what was happening that day, uh, what you needed assembled. Uh, in the activity details, you could put dietary restrictions or food restrictions, that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, you're welcome to join uh, Karen. Uh, I will join, but Karen will be the one you want to talk to in terms of how this all transpired um, because she's the one very much who, who put it all together. So yeah, thank you for, for having me and uh, I hope I didn't run long. I'm not sure where I'm at for time. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. That's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, sessions to I want to see, and uh, Joe was just asking in the chat if the aim is for the sessions to be recorded, and yes, uh, each session will hopefully be recorded and shared on the on the city page as soon as as soon as they've been kind of um, made ready and, and uploaded to YouTube. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next speaker, and um, this this is Eric in New York. Um, let me. I, There we go. Okay. Hi. I think I'm really excited to see all of the creative solutions that people are building out of Civi. Uh, a lot of inspiring ideas. Uh, so to talk about uh, Flatbush United Mutual Aid and and our use of Civi CRM. Um, let's see if I can share my screen correctly. Always great when tech people really don't know what they're doing. Um, so Flatbush United Mutual Aid is a um, small ad hoc organization that formed out of neighbors trying to help each other during the crisis. Um, originally, uh, the... Sorry, what did I get? A different tab running. Um, Originally, when the group formed, uh, another neighborhood was doing a similar mutual aid project and the folks that were working there handed over some code to the folks who were starting uh, Flappers United. And it was all based in proprietary systems. It's a very kind of interesting automated system that takes calls through a voice over IP system those all get dumped into a proprietary system, which is Airtable. And then people would manually pull things out of that, call people, find out what they needed, put that into a Slack channel where somebody else would change an icon manually on the Slack message to indicate that they, they were taking on this delivery or something. And at a small scale, it would have been great, but you know, I, COVID is a global crisis. Um, the U.S. is the worst hit nation in the world. New York State is the worst hit state within the United States. New York City is the worst hit within New York State. And Flatbush is one of a dozen of the worst hit neighborhoods in New York City. So the need was overwhelming. Um, we had thousands and thousands of, of calls that weren't being processed. So um the idea was to bring in civi in order to coordinate all of that um i'll go into a lot of the details in the breakout um but to give a quick overview there is um a web form the web form when it's filled out um, creates a civi case and then those cases can be tracked and assigned. Um, as we were building this out, the uh, folks who were doing the real work realized that the model that we were building, which was a very individualized uh, thing where one person was requesting food, another person was going to the supermarket, buying that food, and either delivering it themselves or handing it off to another person who did the delivery. And that system was able to handle about 20, 
30 requests a month, uh, a week. Um, in the three months since Flatbush United started, we have delivered food to more than 600 families. Um, and this is an entire volunteer ad hoc, no organization behind it, funded by neighbors sending in money. Um, 400 of those deliveries were in the past three or four weeks since we shifted to a CIVI-based system. Um, and with that, I will talk more later about the decisions of what we, actually one last thing, this system is currently built on Drupal 7 um, and it will be moving to backdrop CMS. Um, move, working on Drupal 7 was a very intentional decision um, because of my own political views about sustainable software. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of interesting discussion to be had in the civic community of where our focuses lie and um, what it means that a lot of uh, really talented folks have been chasing Drupal 8 for three years. Um, and what could, where we could be now had that not happened. But that is, again, my own perspective because what I'm seeing in the mutual aid networks that are arising is none of them are going with free software. The, what we're doing in Flatbush is unfortunately unique right now. Um, and I think that uh, is unfortunate. Um, having been in the civic community for about 15 years, um, I just think that we need to rise to the challenge that Lobo laid down before us. And I'm gonna do my best to do that. Uh, I'm now gonna hand this off to the folks who are doing the real work. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, Jake or Amy, which one of you wants to uh, take this on? Um, I, why don't you jump in? I can, I can uh, speak real quickly to you. So, so I, I, I do not have a, a tech background whatsoever. I have a, I have a food background. Um, and so I, during the first like opening months of the crisis, when we were figuring out our systems, we quickly realized that the the peer to peer grocery shopping um, method was just not going to work um, in any, any way, shape or form to address. We had a backlog of <clears throat> almost 2000 requests in the system before we shut down our phone lines. And in the time that our phone lines were shut down, we received 23,000 requests um, for food for assistance. Um, and the, the vast majority of those were for food. Um, <clears throat> so since my background is in food systems, um, I, we decided to switch over to like a, a, a bulk buying model where we work with wholesalers and local farmers uh, to bring produce in. Um, <clears throat> and a, a bunch of other mutual aid organizations in Brooklyn um, sort of made a similar move at the same time. Um, but there was definitely a, a tendency towards a lowest common den denominator system of switching to like a food pantry model where every family got the same bag of food, same size bag of food, regardless of need or family size. Um, and we made a really intentional decision um, since we were giving up a, a highly personalized like grocery shopping system where we went to the store and bought exactly what the neighbor wanted for food um, that we needed to come up with a way to sort of preserve the human dignity of our system, um, which presented us with like a ton of challenges. Um, and kind of, and so <clears throat> what it ended up being was we were gonna need to keep a sort of um, like an, an inventory of food, uh, things that we were ordering from, from farmers and from wholesalers that our neighbors could shop from. And then in addition to that, still allowing for a certain degree of like customization. So everyone who gets groceries from us has the option to add um, extra <laughs> items to the list like diapers or dog food or, you know, um, uh, diabetic uh, medicines and foods and <clears throat> stuff like that. And that's, for us, has been like a, a really big um, point of pride is that we're able to meet people where they're at. But the, <laughs> the logistics of that is, is, da is 
absolutely daunting. Um, and originally, the the idea was to go with a we were going to have a Google form that people filled out, um, and it was just very very quickly became obvious that that was like not a safe way to do things and not an effective way to do things. It they, it wasn't going to be able to meet, you know, it was maybe half of our needs for what we needed. Um, and Eric and the tech team were able to come up with using the Civi CRM with this intake form, um, with a way to do that uh, data outputs where we could create, <laughs> create inventories, create order forms, um, create packing slips um, for our volunteers, create delivery instructions, create um, like address mapping data that we could use to um, develop routes for our drivers. Um, and that's, that's sort of, that's what trans like completely transformed um, the way that we were doing our intake and the way that we were reaching people. Like you said, we, the, the majority of the people, I think it's, it's actually closer to 500 uh, families that we've served in the last four weeks um, through this system. Our intake volunteers have gone from maybe being able to complete between two and four requests per three hour shift to, you know, 10, 15 sometimes um, in a, in a, in a shift that big, we're doing all of our intake is being done on three days now. Um, we're used to take, you know, six, at least six to seven days to reach the same, like the same number of neighbors contacted. Um, so it's, and it's, it's been absolutely huge um, for us. Our, our costs for groceries have also gone from between 90 and over a hundred dollars per family to under 50 um, for the week while simultaneously also increasing the amount of food that we're, we're able to get to people. Um, so having, having this tool has been like incomparably important to what we're doing. Um, Amy, do you have anything you want to add to that? I, hi, I'm Amy and I'm also not very tech savvy, but I've come at this from an intake perspective. I, I train our volunteers to be able to um, communicate with our neighbors and talk to them about their needs. And so the impetus for this tool really came out of a desire to better ser serve our communities with fewer resources and be able to serve more people. And I had noticed that our intake retention rate was extremely low because of the stress involved of posting an individual shopping list to Slack and then having to constantly check back in to see if a delivery volunteer was picking it up. And a lot of times they would forget to change the status. That was very frustrating on the part of the delivery volunteers. And I would notice we're also geographically located. We're a large, um, we're in the Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn, which covers quite a bit of ground. But then we also border neighborhoods that don't necessarily have other mutual aid groups. And so we were trying to honor those requests as well. And, you know, trying to get a car and the to go quite far away and then only deliver one to one family was also part of this impetus. So it was really about we're volunteers helping volunteers in this crisis, helping neighbors in this crisis, and how do we use our resources more efficiently? That's it for me. May I ask a short question to Eric? Please. Yeah. Um, uh, Eric, you once mentioned the term case or oh, several times. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, um, I would like to find out, did you also use CV case as yes. a basis? For, oh, all right, that's interesting. Yes, we're using CV case and CV volunteer. Um, okay. And uh, at first the idea was to use CV case because we were doing a very individualized shopping and delivery and things, as Jake said, were getting lost. And as Amy said, they were getting lost in the system. Somebody would post something to Slack. No one would respond to it. No one knew that no one had responded to it. So the idea was to start case tracking so we could at least make sure that everything actually got responded to. OK. Yeah, thank you very much. Interesting. Hasn't been uh, used so very often, right? Civic case, it's fairly new, I guess. Uh, well, the new version is well the new version is relatively new it's 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 nice the the data model is clean i've been very happy with it great thanks
See you later. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, Eric, um, Amy, um, and, um, um, and Jacob. Sorry. Um, I'm simultaneously trying to figure out how to unspotlight video while thanking people. I'm not very good at doing two things at once. Um, it, it's true what you said at the start, tech people trying to use a new a tech tool that is relatively new to us is, is its own sitcom. Um, uh, we're now going to move on to the final session for this initial uh, round, which um, is about using Civi CRM for crowdfunding um, and peer to peer fundraisers. And for that, I'm going to bring in Alejandro from Ixium. And I should also just mention we are, owe a great debt to Alejandro and Ixium, Ixium for um, providing us with the technology for today. Um, the, the Zoom accounts and host accounts are uh, thanks to them. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, thanks for the intro and yeah, it's been a pleasure to help to this uh, great initiative. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a couple of slides and also have a, something to demo, but it will be quick because we'll be doing the <clears throat> breakout uh, room number one. And um, yeah, I mean, um, so uh, we are, well, Ixian, we are CVCRM consultancy based in Barcelona in Spain. We've been around, yeah, I think that we are the ones more than 10 years uh, been working with CV. So we are really happy to keep contributing to the project. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, we uh, received some, uh, we've been uh, chasing this feature for a while uh, before COVID-19, uh, some of our clients, which are NGOs, charities uh, of different sizes and different countries, were already <clears throat> asking um, to do something similar that you know Facebook does with you know, birthdays and um, and other commercial platforms. Uh, so we wanted uh, to to uh, bring this. Uh, alive but we never had you know time or uh, resources to to finish wrapping this up and this uh, COVID-19 situation <clears throat> kind of pushed us to to finish what we've been uh, chasing for some uh, some months and um, actually um, what it is is it's a let's say it's called a solution or, or a maybe a a way for using CV, using one of the already features that CV has, uh, but for a specific uh, purpose, let's say, which is uh, uh, helping organizations to do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, called or overlap with uh, crowdfunding. Hopefully we'll be able to explain a little bit the differences between crowdfunding, uh, peer-to-peer -peer or uh, other fundraising techniques or approaches. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, obviously this uh, crisis uh, uh, push organization to maybe adapt or change a little bit uh, uh, ways that they were doing uh, traditional fundraising using traditional channels like face-to-face uh, -face or uh, telemarketing uh, because well because of the lockdown uh, you know people are not more on the streets and maybe they don't want you know telemarketers to be calling them so for the fundraising uh, sector this kind of changed a little bit the, the rules and um, uh, yeah well, we, we will get into more detail in our demo and I'm that we are tight on the schedule, so I will be very quick. But uh, yeah, the, this crisis changed a little bit the rules of fundraising, and um, everything that is online is now uh, being prioritized over traditional channels. Uh, so yeah, mostly uh, charities or organizations were already doing uh, online uh, fundraising, but uh, the situation needs to uh, uh, 
pushes organizations to be more creative or try to uh, do more online stuff over traditional channels. So this brings to a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising. I guess that most of you are familiar with, with the concept, maybe some others know, and sometimes there's a mix uh, between peer-to-peer uh, -peer and uh, crowdfunding. Both are uh, fundraising techniques. Um, but the special thing of peer-to-peer -peer is that uh, uh, it's a type of fundraising that persons, individuals from the organization actually act as fundraisers for the organization, which they are not fundraisers. They can be donors or part of their constituents. So uh, this, uh, let's say, technique or this uh, type of fundraising actually for this moment of, the, of, of crisis actually has a lot of, of interesting things because uh, obviously you the community gets more involved because you uh, invite your friends, invite your families to fundraise for your uh, organization. So um, this is an excellent uh, approach to keep with fundraising budgets uh, and trying to cover uh, what you are losing, uh, organizations are losing from other traditional channels. Uh, it has also more advantages of uh, awareness or uh, getting more engagement with your uh, donors or your uh, yeah, constituents. So <clears throat> CVCRM has a very uh, nice feature um, that actually allows to uh, perform peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising. Uh, so we will be explaining a little bit how uh, you can set up a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising campaign. Um, we have an online demo to see how it can look like. Uh, and it's actually, um, so, so the feature in CVCRM, it's called personal campaigns for, for the ones that you don't know this. It's already there. It's, it's extremely powerful. It's extremely interesting. Uh, it has maybe some work to do on the front end on how you present these campaigns to the, to the visitors, to your web visitors. But once you can sort this out, it, it looks very, very nice. And we've, we've been doing some benchmarks with other commercial platforms um, that offer this, this, this service to organizations. And uh, I can assure that it, it's very, very similar to what other uh, platforms can offer with the difference that this is open source. Uh, we don't charge any fees to our clients. Uh, the organization don't need to pay a fee for the money that they are getting and all the uh, you know benefits for using open source and CVCRM. So actually this is how it can look like. Um, this is a demo website, but uh, an organization can have different projects uh, that they can be fundraising for. Each project in CV terms, it's a contribution page. We, we will get into the details, but let me show you a little bit. Uh, when you enter a project, uh, you can, the organization can offer the possibility to donate directly to the project, which will be traditional uh, fundraising with a contribution page web form. But you can allow a visitor to create uh, uh, their own campaign, a personal campaign. So they can create a, a personal campaign in, in three very easy steps and uh, it can be published uh, in this project and the, the umbrella of this project. Then when someone gets into the page, you can get into the personal campaign and you can donate to the personal campaign. So actually you are contributing to the organization, to the project, but you are also uh, contributing through a personal campaign of some uh, that you trust, someone that you trust. Uh, and it's, uh, it's extremely uh, easy to use. It's very user friendly. And with a little work on the front end that we've been doing, we've been doing with Drupal and the technology that we, that we use. But you can have a very, very uh, powerful platform for doing uh, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising. 
uh, we will get in, we will see the details. We will explain you how to set up and show you the reports, how everything then in CVCRM is connected. So you can see, uh, the organization can see uh, all the money that is coming in to from uh, which person that is running the personal campaign to which project. And it's a, again, it's a very, very powerful feature that is there. Uh, sometimes it's like a hidden jewel that is there, but if with a little work on the front end, it can be extremely powerful and it will allow organizations to run a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising that it's a trend that it will stay for, I guess, a long time, uh, yeah, especially after this crisis. So in the demo, we will uh, explain yeah, all of these, some uh, concepts of fundraising. Uh, the demo will be uh, led from with my colleague, uh, Carolina, which is uh, one of our senior consultants, but also has a post degree on fundraising. So she actually is an expert on the matter. So uh, I, uh, it will be very, very interesting. So it will be kind of a, a yeah, it will be a very practical demo. We will be showing this, uh, this side. We will get into uh, CVCRM, explain you how to set up and how to to run this uh, type of campaigns. Um, so I guess that we are on time. Uh, our demo will be demo room number one. Uh, so if you are interested in peer-to-peer -peer or other fundraising uh, initiatives, just come to our breakout room. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so that's the five uh, se sessions. Um, I, uh, now I'm just going to hand over to uh, Diana School, uh, Schoolman in New York, who just will give a few words about the session that she's giving. Because in addition to these five, we also have Rose, as she mentioned, doing an introdu introduction to CBCRM, and also Dana is doing a session to just one second. I don't know. Hello, everybody. I'm Dana. Um, I just gonna yeah, we're just gonna overview some of the WordPress stuff we work on. Um, our the organizations we work with are arts organizations and member based organizations, and they're trying to integrate uh, civic information into WordPress. And so I'm just gonna basically go through a demo and highlight these seven, I guess, plugins uh, and the various things they do. Like, you know, if it uh, syncs their member status, you can give people, uh, add people to a group in Civi, and then that syncs to a group in WordPress, and that gives them access to private content, and so on. Uh, with Caldera Forms, you can, you know, create a form that does event registration, membership registration, opens a case, um, creates an activity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll go through some of that. Uh, with the Civi CRM event organizer plugin, you can have an event listing on your website. Uh, with that syncs and talks to uh, Civi uh, for registration. And then that too, if you set it up right with a, a redirect, you can have Caldera form views instead of a profile. So you can have complex event registrations uh, that tie into an event page. Um, and the last, the last one is the newest one, which is kind of still very beta, but it's, uh, it's, it's an integration with a plugin called Advanced Custom Fields. And that is a mapping of, uh, to a WordPress. In WordPress, you can have content types, kind of like post pages. You can create custom content types. And those content types tie into entities in Civi. And then those custom fields can be mapped. Um, and that ties in actually to events as well as, uh, the, which works well for uh, you know, member directories uh, and, the, and stuff like that. And it has uh, various fields you can map into Civi and WordPress. So I'm just going to do an overview and a demo of uh, all that. Uh, and then I am going to be in room three uh, talking about that. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, I'm going to put all of the sessions for, in their respective rooms up um, on, uh, on screen now. Um, so I'm hoping everyone's got links to the different rooms in their email, um, but I'll paste them into the chat in case in case that's got lost. Um, 
we were thinking now of taking this sort of 10 minute break, but we're going to sort of stay around here. So feel free to hang around and chat. Um, but if you want to, you know, go and stretch your legs and so forth, um, this is a good time. Uh, just to say again, thanks very much for all the speakers so far and great to see so many of you here. Thank you. Likewise from me uh, and just reiterating once more that when you come back from your break or when you're done hanging out with us, you will be leaving this room and joining one of seven other rooms in the email that Nicole sent you in the last 24 hours. Um, anyway, if you have some issues around that, we can certainly help you during the break time, but we also want to leave room for connection and building community. And yes, um, thank you all for being here and huge thank you to presenters and to Alejandro for the loan of his wonderful technology. <laughs>